Again, it's a privilege to be with you, and I appreciate your faith and prayers in support of my old timbers. As I said, when you get to crowd the Octagarian level of life, you need all the support and strength that you can get. Now, we've said something about Christ coming to Zion. We've kind of indicated that it's maybe a gradual thing. But he will take up his residence in Zion, just like he says in the Book of Mormon. And uh, this will be, in some measure, the beginning of the millennium, at least for the righteous. I think if I was in Zion and the Lord was there, I could uh, invite him in to tell us about the gospel and have him teach us like he taught the Nephites. I would think I was in heaven instead of just the millennium, see. So at least it may be that Christ's coming, so far as the saints are concerned, certainly will be uh, much sooner than the great events spoken of in relation to his coming to the world. Now, as we view this whole picture of events and we move the prophetic picture from Zion now to uh, the Jerusalem scene and see the inner relationship that's involved. We uh, see why the prophet Joseph Smith, for example, talked about three great gatherings. We need to see things in that light. He says, we are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the latter-day glory. That's what we've been talking about now for about two days, isn't it? We are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the latter-day glory. It is left to us to see, participate in, and help to roll forward the latter-day glory, the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God will gather together all things that are in heaven and all things that are upon the earth in one. When, and he identifies these three gatherings now, number one, the saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now, where will they be gathered? See, some people think the gathering of Israel is uh, uh, already happening. And in the sense that we're gathering Ephraim and we're gathering to the gospel and so forth, then yes. But the great mission of the gathering of Israel is still future. You have to see that mission in light of the uh, prophetic picture. For example, as Ezekiel speaks of it, and this is Ezekiel chapter 20, he says, As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. Now, we haven't got to that condition yet in the world. He says, And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. And so they'll know then, not misunderstanding what he says. He adds, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me, and I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. See, Now, that great program of gathering will be to the new Jerusalem. And in order to prepare for it, then you've got to have a cleansing of this land, a cleansing of the saints, and the building of the New Jerusalem. And when the New Jerusalem is built, then this first great gathering that we're talking about here then will get underway. There will be a gathering then of all saints from all nations of the earth to America, north and south. This will be the land of the New Jerusalem. Okay? Now he says, uh, the saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. When the Jews 
will be gathered together in one. Now, that's the second great gathering, the gathering of the Jewish people. And that gathering is only in its infant stages as yet. It will see the millions of Jews in all lands of the earth finally return to their homeland, when the Jews will be gathered together in one. And then the third gathering, and the wicked will also be gathered together to be destroyed, as spoken of by the prophets. Now, the prophets speak of the gathering of the wicked to be destroyed. Now, where are the wicked gathered to be destroyed? And the answer is to Jerusalem. The answer is to the great battle of Armageddon. The answer is to the abomination of desolation that will take place when uh, the devastation is of such magnitude that the blood will run bridal deep in the vales, the valleys, in and around Jerusalem. Now, that's the gathering of the wicked to be destroyed. So if we talk about this last great era of time, then let's talk about it with a focus on Zion, because as Isaiah said, and Paul reiterated, out of Zion shall go forth the deliverer and turn ungodliness from Jacob, see? And then we focus from there down to us and what we're doing about it. All right, so there's three great gatherings then. The saints, and picture in your mind, for example, the fulfillment of uh, the uh, prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 54, where the new Jerusalem has been established, and where he says, Break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities of America to be inhabited. See? And then the gathering of the righteous, all these churches that we are building up in foreign lands, Nephi sees that they will gather, and the Lord will go before them, and they'll have the power of the Lord in their midst. And it will be the day of the Lord's power. It's spoken of over and over again in the Book of Mormon as a time when the Lord will make bare his arm in the eyes of our nation to bring about his purposes. Note, for example, how Nephi puts it in his commentary on uh, two chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah 48 and 49. In 1 Nephi 22, I'm speaking, he says, for example, and I would, my brethren, you should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed, and the emphasis is a positive one, cannot be blessed, unless he that is God shall make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. Wherefore, the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, and his, uh, in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are the house of Israel. Wherefore, he will bring them again out of captivity, and they shall be gathered together to the lands of their inheritance, and they shall be brought out of, out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that the Lord is their Savior and the Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. Now, what does it mean the Lord's going to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations? What does that mean? Well, there was an occasion in ancient times where the Lord made bare his arm in the eyes of one nation in redeeming Israel, and that one nation was Egypt, right? And with power, revelatory uh, manifestations, with plagues, with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, he brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, Nephi sees in 1 Nephi 14 that uh, the time will come when there will be such a polarization of things in relation to the uh, people of God that there will be only two churches. And he says two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, and I'm reading from verse 10 to 1 Nephi 14, Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongs to that great church which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. Now, who is the church of the devil? It's not any given ecclesiastical organization. It's not some of the sectarian churches, one or other, or the mother church. 
It's anyone who doesn't belong to the Church of the Lamb of God and who comes out in opposition. See? And then he sees, for example, that uh, the Church of the Lamb is scattered upon all the face of the earth, and their numbers are few upon all the face of the earth. I beheld that the Church of the Lamb were the saints of God were also upon all the face of the earth, and their numbers upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. And then when he sees that situation, and that situation couldn't happen in the prophetic time picture until after World War II. Why? Because prior to World War II, what happened with all the converts that we made? We brought them on all over America, didn't we? And after World War II, what happened with President McKay? Stay where you are. Gather together in the lands where you are and organize wards and stakes. And we've continued that program, and we have temples built there. And so we have the Church of the Lamb scattered upon all the face of the earth. And then he sees this great era of warfare against Zion. It says, It came to pass that I beheld that the great mother of all nations did gather together multitudes upon the face of the whole earth among the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. Now, that's not just the media turning loose on us. And that great era of warfare will begin with the American Gentiles making warfare, literal, actual, bloody warfare against the Latter-day Saints. And then it will extend into other areas. And Nephi sees them. When it came to pass, he says, that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God that descended upon the saints of the Church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now that's where the Lord makes bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. He will preserve and he will protect them, and it will be a sanctifying experience, because they will learn to rely upon him. And when they are gathered out, they will not go in haste, just like 3 Nephi 21 says, nor will they go by flight, but they will go slowly. Why? because they want to bring as many people as they can with them, to join with them. And where will they gather? They will gather to the land of America, which will be the Zion of God, the new Jerusalem having been established during this period of warfare. See? And the great gathering of Israel then will get underway, and that's it. And what will happen to the Jews? Well, they will gather also. And the time will come, and I don't say this with any negative feelings toward them, but the time will come when they will be good and glad to get out of America because of the turmoil and the chaos that we have here. And they will leave then this land as they will leave other lands, and they will finally then gather wholly and fully and completely uh, to the land of their inheritance. Now, the great program, as it relates to this dispensation, is a two-generation program. Let me turn to the inspired revision of the Bible, Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, the Savior here is talking to the Jews in his day about the destruction, the then imminent destruction of the Jews, and uh, he indicates that they would be uh, scattered throughout the world. He says in verse 19, when you shall see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, then know that the desolation is nigh. Then let them who are in the Judea flee to the housetops or the mountains, and let them who are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them who are in the countries return to enter into the city. He says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them who are with child and them which give suck in those days, where there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. See? Now that destruction that he spoke of at Jerusalem occurred in the year 68 to 70 A.D. When the Roman armies under Titus then gathered around Jerusalem and set up the siege against it, and a million Jews perished, and women became so hungry they ate their own children. And that gets to be a glory sight, see. And the Savior then says, When you see the armies encompassed, Jerusalem encompassed with army, then know that this desolation happens. And we're told then, for example, 
But when the Christians of that period saw those events taking place, they took off. They got out of the place, and they weren't victims of the siege against Jerusalem. But then he goes on, and note what he says, that uh, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We talked about that earlier sometime or other. And uh, it simply means that when Jerusalem is again in the power of the Jews, that the times of the Gentiles are officially over. And that took place not in 1948 fully and completely, it took place in 1967. Now he goes on, and note how the inspired revision adds some further clarification. He says, Now these things he spake unto them concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, and then his disciples asked him, saying, Master, tell us concerning thy coming. Now let's shift to the second coming. And he answered them, and said, In the generation in which the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, and that generation began in 1967, in the generation in which the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, like the sea and the waves roaring, and the earth also shall be troubled and the waters of the great deep, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for the day of your redemption draweth nigh. And then shall you see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And he spake to them a parable, saying, The fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see, and know that uh, of yourselves that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise ye sh are ye, when ye see these signs come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now note this. Verily I say unto you, this generation, this generation when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. Now, how many generations are there in the total program? There's two. One generation we call uh, the initial one, and it's fulfilled when the Jews return to Jerusalem. And that begins the officially then the second generation. And speaking now of the second generation, verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. Now, whether he waits to the latter part of the second generation, I don't know. Now, if you read carefully section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll find it says the same thing. I don't want to take the time to get into that, but section 45 makes it clear that we're dealing with the same kind of prophetic picture and the same kind of clarification, although the inspired revision in Luke 21 is more clear than that statement. Now, uh, as we see this picture, we see the prophet then talking about uh, the wicked gathered around Jerusalem. And let me turn with you to uh, the book of Joel for one example of this. As you go through the biblical prophets, you find many of them speaking then of the, uh, of the gathering of the wicked to Jerusalem and of events then that precede this and events that follow. Now, in the book of Joel, for example, you have two chapters that are of major importance. The second chapter deals with Zion, and chapter 3 deals with Jerusalem, and just about that simple. Now, the angel Moroni, when he visited the prophet Joseph Smith in September of 1823, quoted from the second chapter of Joel. The chapter hadn't been fulfilled yet, but that it would be fulfilled. Now, Joel chapter 2 deals with a great military power called a northern army. It's identified in verse 17 as a heathen force, and it's said then to be the greatest military power that's been amassed in the history of mankind, and it will come to the land of Zion, and it will cause great consternation so that 
Joel 2 starts out with, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mount. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And then he describes this, this power that comes through. And then he indicates that the Lord, he says, will be jealous for his land, verse 18, and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be sanctified and satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations, and I will remove far off this northern army, and will drive him into the land barren and desolate. And then he goes on and says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, Moroni I quoted this latter part, latter portion, explained to Joseph Smith, said that it was on schedule to be fulfilled, but hadn't been, but would be fulfilled. Now, the thing I want to bring this up for is to give you the setting for these later developments that center in Jerusalem. Note, for example, what Joel says in verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, the second place, shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and, now will the third place, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, there are three places of deliverance. The prophet Joseph Smith one time got up and read the whole of the second chapter, and then gave an interesting discourse on it. Uh, the essentials of it are recorded here in the teachings, page 70. He uh, says, for example, in the last days God was to call a remnant, in which was to be deliverance as well as in Jerusalem and Zion. He says, Now if God should give no more revelation, where will we find Zion and this remnant? The time is near when desolation is to cover the earth, and then God will have a place of deliverance in his remnant and in Zion and in Jerusalem. Okay? And he said, Now take away the Book of Mormon and the revelations, and where is our religion? We have none. For without Zion and the place of deliverance we shall fall because the time is near when the sun shall be dark and the moon turned to blood, and so forth. Now, the prophet makes it clear that that remnant is the remnant of Jacob, spoken of in the Book of Mormon. And when this great northern army comes into the land of Zion and raises havoc, and finally then by the Lord is turned back, then the world situation will be such that there will be only three places where there is any kind of stability and safety. One is Mount Zion among the saints, the other is Jerusalem among the Jewish people, and the other is among the remnant of Jacob, who are tribally oriented and who will gather themselves together. And after America has been decimated then by this northern army, then they will go through among the Gentiles like a lion among the beasts of the forest and like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, see. And uh, none can deliver, and that fills up portion, then, of Jesus' prophecies recorded in 35, chapter 16, and 20, and 21, see. But the situation will be, then, that there will be deliverance. Peace will be taken from the earth. Peace will be taken from the earth, and there will be deliverance in three places. And those three places will be places where there is some kind of internal stability among the people. In Mount Zion, we know basically what that is. It will be God's work in his kingdom, see. In Jerusalem, it will be the Jewish people gathered together, some of them believing, but most of the big bulk of them merely having their Jewish traditions and gathered together under those circumstances. But provide a place of safety and stability in a world of chaos. And then the third place will be among the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And that word shall is important. It means he hasn't called them yet, but that he will. And when then the time comes, he will call them, and they'll unite. They'll unite them together, and they will be a power in this land, and they'll go through among the decadent Gentiles like a lion among the flock of sheep, see? And there will be a place of safety for them. And you have a world situation like that. That will be the world situation. 
I ask for one different example. We keep on on the path of insanity that we're following, uh, and the American economy goes under, and uh, the economy of Western civilization goes under. What is the end result? Where is there any stability? Where will we have any kind of stability as Latter-day Saints? We've enjoyed the freedoms of this land for some time, at least to a degree. We got kicked from one end of the nation to the other. But there wasn't a time along the way that we couldn't send missionaries out, and there wasn't a time along the way when we couldn't at least argue about liberty and say that we felt we ought to have a little of it. When we got out here in the West, then we had a homeland in this great land with the Constitution. But suppose all that passes away into turmoil and chaos, then where do we go? Where do we look for safety? Where do we look for, for a, a supporting bulwark? of strength and power from which we can teach the gospel, and the answer is you won't find it in the world. You'll have to finally get on the stick and build Zion, and we'll do it willingly because we have to, whether we think we ought to or not. See? And when we do then, then there will be safety in Mount Zion, and meantime the Jews then will gather to Jerusalem, and they'll be glad to get out of this land in its circumstances and in other lands. And they'll establish Jerusalem in a full program, and they'll quit hassling about things that go on over there, and they'll really build the program. And I'm not saying that I'm all in favor of what the Jews are doing. The Arab people are a very beautiful and loving people. I've spent some time over there with them. And it's a sad thing the way they're being treated by many, and the pawns that they are made by the powers of the nations of the earth. See? And uh, the issues that are there, and there needs to be intelligent and righteous and proper solutions to that program. How that finally works out, I don't know. But that's the setting now for this whole thing, and then there's safety in Jerusalem. And then, having spoken about then Joel turns his prophetic focus on Jerusalem, and he says, But behold, in those days, and I'm reading verse 1 of chapter 3, and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted by land. Now, where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? Well, if you're standing on the eastern wall of Jerusalem, and uh, the temple lot is right there, the dome of the rock is there, and you look east. You see, not too far away, about from here to the other end of the little town here of Snowflake, that kind of distance, with a big valley in between, and you see the Mount of Olives. And that valley in between is called the Kidron Valley, and prophetically it's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And so he's going to gather people to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and this will be a very decisive kind of thing. He says, for example, proclaim ye among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. That's the reverse of the general statement we love and hope will come to pass. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. And he says, Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the heathen round about. And then he speaks of this as a time of decision. Multitudes, multitudes, he says, in the valley of decision. Now, why is it called the valley of decision? Because if the Jews are overrun and destroyed, that's the end of the program. And if the Jews then are sustained, and the Gentiles then are turned one against the other, as the Lord will do when he stands upon the Mount of Olives, and they cut each other's throats, and the blood runs, blood runs bridal deep, the end result will be that Jerusalem will be redeemed. You see that? That will be the end result. And uh, so this is a time of decision. And so he says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withhold their light. And the Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice out of Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people, and so forth. See? So we're talking now about three great gatherings. Now, in order to get this picture a little more in focus in relation to, to the Jews and Jerusalem, uh, let me turn to the 
Further replies, I'd like to come then to section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in order to get the clarifications of this latter day scripture that we're prim placing primary focus upon. But to begin with, let me turn over here to this unit in the Pearl of Great Christ that we call Smith Matthew, used to be called uh, uh, Joseph Smith's writings or Smith One. But here, the Savior then is speaking to his people, sitting there on the Mount of Olives, talking to his disciples. And they want to know two basic things. Here in verse 4, they say, Tell us, when shall these things be which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews? That's the first thing they want to know. This immediate thing that was facing them, that Luke 30, 21 is talking about, that we've read. And the second thing, they says, What is the sign of thy coming? And at the end of the world, or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world? Now, they want to know those two things. And so the Savior then, first of all, focuses in on the immediate scene, and the coming then of judgments to Jerusalem. And having treated that, and that takes up about the first twenty-five verses, then he turns his attention to what we call the sign of the Son of Man. And he makes that then the beginning of his explanation. Now, what is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? Well, it's a brilliant light in the heavens, <clears throat> a brilliant light in the heavens. And uh, as such, then, people will think that it's a comet, they'll think that it's a planet, and uh, they look upon it in fear. Now, there's a statement in the uh, historical department of the Church, people quoting Joseph Smith as saying that the sign of the Son of Man would be the return of the city of Enoch, because the sign of the Son of Man is right in those last stages now that uh, <coughs> uh, pertain to the events of the Second Coming. And uh, as it is made manifest, it's a brilliant light in the East. And so Jesus says then, verse 25, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even to the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if you're looking for the second coming, and you want to know when it happens, what then do you look for? Well, you look for, first of all, the sign of the Son of Man. So you look for that great event and that uh, transpiring uh, phenomenon that will take place. And uh, as the prophet Joseph Smith explained it, it will be like thought by some people to be a planet. And, boy, that will cause consternation, because here you see that brilliant light in the heaven moving on in. And what do you think? Wow, we're right in the line of fire. And that ought to cause someone to repent. It'll cause a lot to commit suicide and all that, but it ought to cause some to repent, see? And the light of that will cover the whole earth like the light of the sun. Not necessarily it'll come from the east, we don't know. But it will be like the light of the sun coming out of the earth and filling the whole earth. Now, having expressed the sign of the Son of Man, as a focal point to which they should look. Then Jesus <clears throat> explains things leading up to that sign and its manifestation. And he says, Now I will show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. Now we've said there's three great gatherings. The gathering of the saints to Zion the gathering of the Jews to Jerusalem. And then, in the midst of that last gathering, at the tail end of the thing, there will be a gathering of the wicked against the Jews in Jerusalem, see? And there they will be destroyed, destroyed, not by the military power of the Jewish people, but by the intervention of Christ as he stands upon the Mount of Olives. But he says, okay, now let me give you a parable. It's kind of like uh, uh, the eagles gathering to the carcass. 
And that's all rather homely illustration, but it gets the idea over. And he says, And they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Behold, I speak of for mine elect sake, for nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, these are wars that are still future to us. This is the era of warfare that Nephi sees when the nations of the Gentiles make war against Zion. And then the Lord turns them one against the other. And there will be wars of a devastating nation among them. And they'll have something to do besides badgering the saints that they're making war against. See? Because the attention will be turned then one toward the other. And he says, Behold, I speak unto mine elect sake, for a na- elect sake, for a nation shall rise against nation, kin against kin, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. And then he says, And again, because iniquity shall abound, and he again refers back to a previous statement of things as they would exist among the Jews prior to the destruction of the Jewish system in 68 A.D., when he says in verse 10, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, he comes back to that and puts it on the broader scale, on the world scale, and on the latter-day scale. And he says, And again, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall not be overcome, the same shall be saved. Now, why does, why does iniquity abound when, uh, uh, as a basis, then, or why does the love of many wax cold, rather, uh, take place as a consequence of iniquity? And the answer is because when iniquity is present, the Spirit of the Lord withdraws, and there is no love. There might be zeal without knowledge, and there might be a lot of emotion, but there is no love except by and through the Spirit of the Lord. See? And so the Spirit will withdraw, and as a result, then the love of many shall wax cold. And he says, And again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And that implies an apostasy from the Savior's point of vantage back there when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, an apostasy and then a restoration, a new dispensation of the gospel. And again, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come of the destruction of the wicked. And again shall the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, be fulfilled. Now, what's the abomination of desolation? Well, it's the gathering of these forces and powers against Jerusalem. Now, it's going to again be fulfilled. When was it fulfilled the first time? When the Roman armies gathered around Jerusalem. And they took up their siege against Jerusalem, and there was a million Jews perished. Now, that kind of thing is going to happen again. And the Jews then were overrun. The city capitulated. And uh, the Jewish people then were shipped out and scattered. Now, likewise, that whole scenario will take place again, including the capitulation of the Jewish people as a nation. And they will be overrun by heathen hordes. And then as the Jews' resistance finally uh, breaks down and the two prophets who were there holding uh, the Gentiles in abeyance by the manifestation of their powers are killed and their bodies lie in the street, then before the Gentiles go in and mop up, they'll say, let's celebrate. And they'll send presents to each other. And commendatory statements. Hey, you did a great job. Boy, we really mopped those guys up. Now we're through with the Jews, see? And this will take place then for a little while, and then Christ will stand upon the Mount of Olives. And this will signal not only the deliverance of the Jews, but it will signal the resurrection of the just. And among the resurrection of the just will be those two prophets whose bodies are unburied and still lying in the street. And they will rise up on their feet, and it will be a rather interesting scene to see that one. It will throw fear and consternation in the hearts of those who see. And then, as Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, there will be a great earthquake that will divide the city of Jerusalem into three parts, and the Mount of Olives will cleave asunder, part of it moving to the east, to the south, and part to the north, and a huge valley will be created in between. And into the valley the Jews then will flee for safety. And there, in the seclusion of that valley, while blood and thunder go on round about them, while the Gentiles, in their fear and consternation, turn one upon another and cut each other's throats, and the blood runs bridal deep in the surrounding areas, there the Jews then will look upon their long-rejected Messiah. See? 
and they'll say, what are these marks that are in your hands and your side? And he will disclose himself as Jesus of Nazareth, their Lord and their God, whom they crucified. And then the pain that they experience will be even greater than the pain that they've had to endure in the abomination of desolation. It will be a pain of the soul, a pain of the heart, and they will weep every family apart. And they'll confess their Christ and their God, and they'll be converted as a nation. They'll be baptized for the remission of their sins. And then the temple which will have been built by then, then will be rebuilt and refurbished, dedicated. And uh, the uh, blessings of the holy priesthood will be given to them. And then the temple which will have been built by them, then will be rebuilt and refurbished dedicated, and uh, the uh, blessings of the holy priesthood will be given to them, and they'll officiate them in the temple night and day, as those ordinances then are performed and carried out. And as this takes place, then the great program and order of things has been built up in Zion will be transferred over there. The Prophet Joseph Smith, for example, on two occasions talked of the great council of God that would be held in Jerusalem, and there would be a uniting of the two poles of, of God's government. The Jews then will have the kingdom of God established in their midst, and as that takes place then there will be this great council of God. And there will be a union of the two governments, of the two poles of power, and there will be a centralization of the power and authority of both governments in Zion, so that the statement of Isaiah will be fulfilled, that the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. See? And the word of the Lord going forth from Jerusalem simply means that God's word there, as they meet together for their sacrifices and for their festivities and for their solemn assemblies and their meetings, God's word will go forth. It also means that if you want to study the scriptural words in their purity and in their origin, you're going to have to go to Jerusalem. If you want to study today, for example, the, the earliest records of Isaiah, where do you have to go? Well, you have to go to Jerusalem. You have to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you not, see? And there will be other records of that kind that will be found and unearthed, records including the writings of the apostles of the Lord, and other records will come forth in the latter day, and uh, the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem, see? That will be a beautiful kind of situation. Now, Jesus, as he talks about that, again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel will be fulfilled. There will be a repeat of the scenario when the Roman armies under Titus then besieged Jerusalem and it capitulated. There will be another time when that will happen. And then the Savior says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verily, he says, I say unto you, this generation in which these things shall be shown forth shall not pass away until all that I have told you shall be fulfilled. See? Now, we have some clarifications on that picture in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I'd like, for example, to uh, turn to section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants with you to get uh, the picture as it's expressed there. Section 45 is an interesting revelation in that it's a re-revelation of the teachings of Jesus as he sat upon the Mount of Olives and taught his disciples. Someone made a tape recording of it, and they played that tape recorder through the spirit of revelation to Joseph Smith, and he wrote it down. And that's what we've got in section 45. Now, note how he puts it. He's talking, for example, here about uh, uh, his reasoning in favor of building the kingdom of God, and he says, uh, Wherefore hearken, and I will reason with you, verse 15, and I will speak unto you, and prophesy as unto men in days of old, and I will show it plainly as I showed it unto my disciples, as I stood before them 
in the flesh, and spake unto them, saying, See, now he's repeating for us the same instructions he gave to his disciples, saying, As ye have asked of me concerning the signs of my coming in the day, he says, When I uh, shall come in my glory in the clouds of heaven, to fulfill the promises I made unto your fathers, for as ye have looked upon the long absence of your spirits from your bodies to be a bondage, I will show unto you how the day of redemption shall come, and also, now two things, one, how the day of redemption in the sense of resurrection will come, and number two, also the restoration of scattered Israel. Now he focuses in on those two things, see, and uh, he makes it clear then that there's not going to be a general resurrection until these things that he's going to explain take place. Some people have the idea that Christ, having broken the bands of the resurrection, they're going to kind of grind things out from that point on, kind of steadily. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith dealt with that situation with a good sister, not a member of the church, but a gal by the name of Jemima Wilkinson, who claimed that she died and went to heaven and then returned and was now ministering among the people with some kind of special calling, and she was resurrected. Now, bless her soul, she later died. But the prophet Joseph Smith talking about her says this, Jemima Wilkinson was another prophetess that figured lately in America in the last century. She stated that she had taken sick and died and that her soul went to heaven where it still continues, and soon after her body is reanimated with the spirit and power of Christ upon which she set out to be a public teacher. He goes on and says, and declared that she had an immediate revelation. Now, the scriptures positively assert that Christ is the first fruits afterwards those that are Christ, quote, at his coming. A time point, a time reference. He says, then cometh the end. But Jemima according to her testimony, died and rose again before the time mentioned in the scriptures. Now, what is he saying? There's a time of resurrection. What is that time? It's at Christ's coming. Okay? All right, now, the Savior here back there in the time of his earthly ministry, sitting on the hill of Mount of Olives, talking with them, they know that they're not going to be immediately resurrected. And how do they look at things? They look upon the long absence of their spirits and their bodies as being a bondage. And so they're inquisitive and say, Lord, tell us how we're going to be redeemed. We'd kind of like to know a little of the future. And so he then says, I'll tell you then, the day of your redemption and uh, uh how things will be in that time. And then he proceeds to unfold the program of the latter days. He says, Verily I say unto you that it... Uh, well, let's go back to verse 18. And now behold, this temple which is in Jerusalem, which ye call the house of God, and like the, the way he expresses that, which ye call the house of God. See, he didn't quite own it. He says, uh, And your enemies say that this house shall never fall. But verily I say unto you that desolation shall come upon this generation as a thief in the night, and this people shall be destroyed and scattered among all nations. And this temple which ye now see shall be thrown down, and there shall be not left one stone upon another. And it shall come to pass in that in this generation of Jews shall not all pass away, until every desolation which I have told you concerning them shall come to pass. Your dear eyes know, ye know that the end of the world cometh. Ye also know that the heavens and the earth shall pass away. And this you say truly. For so it is. But these things which I have told you shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem, that when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all the nations, all nations. And they should be, but he said, but they should be gathered in. Now the, the scene shifts from the time of the Jewish destruction and their scattering to the latter day. But they should be gathered again. 
but they shall remain, that is, in their scattered condition, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the times of the Gentiles then mark the real gathering of Israel, although the Jewish people themselves, many of them, come to Jerusalem as they have, uh, beginning with the events following World War I and on up through the battle for declaration and on through the uh, events that led to the war of 1948 and so forth. Then you have the Jews then gathered there. But the main gathering of the Jews will not take place, he indicates, until after what? The times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You see that? And then he says, And in that day, in that day of the times of the Gentiles, when they fulfilled, shall be heard of wars and rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them, and they shall say that Christ delayeth his coming unto the end of the earth, and the love of men shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. And then he talks about our time, when the times of the Gentiles is coming, the light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and this is going to be the light of the gospel. And he gets the restoration in there. He says, But they receive it not, for they receive not the light, and they turn their hearts strongly because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And he goes on then to explain the circumstances that follow. And then he finally brings the picture down to his second coming. And let me begin with you here on verse 42. And before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun shall be darkened and the moon turned into blood, and the stars of heaven fall. Now, what's the reason all that happens? Someone's going to get on the moon and paint it red? <laughs> no. The atmospheric condition will be such that the sun will be darkened, and the moon will be turned to blood. And he says, And then shall they look for me, and behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off. But before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump. And that's the seventh angel, Michael. Shall sound his trump. The saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. Wherefore, if you have slept in peace, blessed are you, for as you now behold me and know that I am. Now he's still sitting there talking with the Jews on the Mount of Olives. As you now see me and know that I am, even so, he says, shall you come unto me, and your soul shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected, and the saints shall come forth from the four quarters of the earth. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations. Now, see, the arm of the Lord falls upon the nations when he stands on the Mount of Olives. And just immediately before that, immediately before that, the resurrection of the righteous takes place. And then they come forth. And then his, uh, the arm of the Lord falls. And the arm of the Lord then is Christ standing upon the Mount of Olives in this great earthquake. It's not just an earthquake. It's much bigger than that. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a cataclysmic upheaval so that the earth will reel to and fro on its axis. He goes on to say, Then shall the Lord set his foot upon the mount, and then and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. In other places in the case, the earth will reel to and fro as a drunken man. Now, you'll see the sun come up in the morning by 10 o'clock. It'll have set somewhere down in the south or the north. And by 2 o'clock in the morning, in the afternoon, it'll be on over here, and it'll zigzag back and forth across the heavens. Now, that's one sign that I think a, even a late sleeper ought to pick up on. And the earth is reeling to and fro on its axis, and what happens to the water of the ocean? It'll heave beyond its bounds. You see that? And uh, uh, the nations of the, of the, the, the cities of the nations of the earth will crumble. They'll be reduced to chaos and to rubble. And Jerusalem then will be divided into three parts. And the Mount of Olives will cleave asunder. And these great events then will be underway. And as they are, then the Lord will make his appearance among the Jewish people. Now let me turn with you from this point. Over, he goes on and says, The Lord will have his voice from the ends of the earth, and all the nations shall hear it, and mourn, and calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorn, and so forth. 
But uh, then he goes on and talks about it. Maybe I better put this in at this point. He says, And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds and the wounds of thy hands and feet? And he says, Then shall they know that I am the Lord, and I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I have wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who is lifted up. I am Jesus who is crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. And then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. See? All right, now in section 29, we have another major contribution made in Latter-day Revelation concerning this picture. The Lord here, for example, speaks of his coming in his glory. Verse 12. Uh, well, let's go back to verse 11. I will reveal myself from heaven in, with power and great glory, with all the hosts thereof, and will dwell in righteousness with men on the earth a thousand years, and the wicked shall not stand. And then he says, And again, there I say unto you, verse 12, It hath gone forth in a firm decree by the will of the Father, that mine apostles at Jeru- are the twelve, which were with me at, in my ministry at Jerusalem, I suspect that excludes Judas and includes Matthias, shall stand at my right hand in the day of my coming in a pillar of fire, being clothed with robes of righteousness, with crowns upon their heads in glory even as I am, to judge the whole house of Israel, even as many as have loved me and kept my commandments and none else. And then coming back to this trumpet sound, the trump of Michael, the seventh angel, he says, And the trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai. Now he gives us an illustration of how it will be. If you turn back to Exodus to chapter 19, You'll pick up the picture there of what he's talking about, a trump sounding long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai. Our section of chapter 19, verse 19, it talks about the, the great event when uh, Moses brought Israel out of her camp to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord. And in verse 18 it says, The Mount Sinai was altogether upon a smoke, because the Lord descended the Father in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of the furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and loud, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and the Lord answered him by a voice. Now that's what I call the first great fireside that was ever held among the people of the Lord, when they met with the Lord on the smoking of Mount Sinai, see. But aside from the trivia statement there, which I'll repent quietly and carefully, rapidly, then it gives us an insight as to the events of Christ's second coming. He says, A trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai, and all the earth shall quake, and they shall come forth, yea, even the dead which die in me, to receive a crown of righteousness and to be crowned clothed upon even as I am, to be with me, that we may be one. But behold, I say unto you that before this great day, now before he comes in the resurrection, he steps back then in time, that before this great day shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall be turned into blood, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and there shall be greater signs in heaven above and in the earth beneath, and there shall be weeping and wailing among the hosts of men, and there shall be a great hailstorm sent forth to destroy the crops of the earth. Now that hailstorm is, is uh, an event that takes place immediately before Christ comes to the Jewish people. It's not really a part, at least this one isn't, is not really a part of the situation that leads up to the cleansing of Zion, as sometimes we are led to believe. And it shall come to pass, because of the wickedness of the people, he says, I will take vengeance upon the wicked, for they will not repent, for the cup of my indignation is full. And behold, my blood shall not cleanse them, if they will hear me not. Wherefore I, the Lord, will send forth flies upon the face of the earth, which shall take hold of the inhabitants thereof, and shall eat their flesh, and shall cause maggots to come in and upon them. This is a good after-dinner speech, if you want to give a real one. And he says, And their tongues shall be stayed, and they shall not utter against me, and their flesh shall fall from off their bones, and their eyes from their sockets. And it shall come to pass that the beasts of the forest and the fowls of the air shall be devoured them, and the great and abominable church. Now this is where, when uh, the heathen and Gentile forces, including the great and abominable church, gathers against Jerusalem, 
the great and abominable church which the whore of all the earth shall be cast down by devouring fire, according to the uh, what is spoken by the mouth of Ezekiel, who spoke of these things. And, uh, so we see this general picture, and uh, let me just kind of fit it in in the time that we've got left and bring it on into the millennial period. We see then in the prophetic picture the establishment of Zion. We see Christ coming to his temple to make kings and priests of those who have been prepared for that final act of placing the capstone on the house of Israel uh, in their gathering to Zion. And then we see, for example, the great council of Adam and Diamond, where the final preparations were made for the second coming, and the judgment is set. The judgment is set means that they, they set the program out. Okay, you're supposed to do this, and you're supposed to do this, and you angel, you do that, and you do this, because now we're going to go to Jerusalem. And then when they go to Jerusalem, then Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives. And just immediately before, almost as he does it, then the resurrection of the righteous takes place. See? And uh, the Mount of Olives cleaves asunder. And this isn't just a simple earthquake. This is a cataclysmic upheaval of such magnitude that the earth wobbles and reels and is actually knocked out of its orbit. And it's like a, a lost sheep running here, there, and there. And men's hearts really begin to fail, and they wonder where they're going. They're on a wild uh, travel through space, and their hearts fail them, and they fall down, and then they see this brilliant light in the heavens, the sign of the Son of Man, and they think they're going to be bombarded from that course. See? And uh, in the midst of all this, then, you see uh, the Jewish people converted as a nation, and the order of the kingdom of God, which the Latter-day Saints have built up in Zion, is transferred over there. And the new the economic order of Zion is transferred among the Jews, and that will kind of help the reputation of the Jews to have that order established among them, they'll practice it. And then you'll have the government of God set up among the Jews. And uh, a nation will be born in a day, and the ordinances of the temple will administered. And he will be brought into the church of the firstborn. And all things will be prepared, so that in the few months' time, as Christ, after he stands upon the Mount of Olives, then this great event of his coming in glory in the clouds of heaven. And uh, this, as I've said, will be preceded by the resurrection of the righteous. And they will come with him. One of the clarifications that Moroni made in the great Malachi prophecy that the earth would be burned as stubble and so forth is that they that come, not just Christ, they that come shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. See? And this will be a renewal of the earth. Now over in section 101, beginning with verse 23, and we'll try and get through this then before we conclude this evening, you have the Lord's statement now concerning the renewal of the earth. We have in section Article of Faith number 11, the statement we believe, not only the gathering of Israel and the restoration of the ten tribes with this, that Zion will be upon this, the American continent, the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. It's going to be brought back to a position somewhat comparable to that which it enjoyed before the fall, when the veil is taken off and the glory and power of God is made manifest. And the Lord then, here in section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 23, beginning, invites us to consider these things and explain some of the events related to them. He says, Prepare for the revelation which is to come, when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. And every corruptible thing, both of man and of the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heavens and of the fish of the sea that dwells upon all the face of the earth, shall be consumed. Now, how will they be consumed? They will be consumed by the glory of the Lord, so brilliant in its power and its manifestation that they will literally go up in smoke. The mountains will fall down in his presence, and the waters will boil. Can you imagine the glory of a person, namely the glorified Christ, of such intensity that when the veil is taken off, the whole earth then is literally cleansed? Now, what kind of a being is Christ? See, he's a glorified being. And let me suggest to you that when they're burned, they won't be burned like a blowtorch burning on their skin outside. They'll be burned from within. Why? 
because the manifestation of his glory is intelligence and its truth and its light and it's such concentration that it is foreign to corruption. And that corruption isn't just on the skin, it's on the inside. And you begin to burn from within because of the corruption within your soul, see. And the wicked will be a stubble. So he says then that every corruptible thing, both of man or the beast of the field or the fowls of the heavens or the fish of the sea, shall uh, that dwells upon the face of shall be consumed. And also that of elements shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new. Now this is, isn't a scorching fire. All things shall become new. There is a cleansing, there is a burning by the power of his glory, because that which is corrupt cannot stand it. But then there is a renewing of that which remains. There is a quickening of life. There is an infusion of light and truth and living powers within all things. And the earth then is raised back to a state of paradisical glory, see? He says, and, and uh, uh, things are elements and melt with fervent heat, and all things you become new. And then note, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon the earth. Now there is a reason why he renews the earth, so that it will be compatible with the manifestations of his glory. And when we talk about the, and use the word, the scriptural passage that says that the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, we're not talking about theological knowledge. We're talking about revelatory knowledge. We're talking about knowledge through the Spirit, because the earth has been cleansed and renewed and elevated. And his knowledge then and glory shall dwell upon all the face of the earth. And the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that power and that light and that truth and that knowledge of righteousness and of truth will transform those who remain, including the animal kingdom. It goes on to say, for example, and in that day the enmity of man and the enmity of beast, yea, the enmity of all flesh, shall cease before my face. And the lamb will literally lie down with the lion. And the child will literally put his hand in the cockatrice den, which is a deadly serpent. These things will be literal by reason of the transformations that take place. Some people read Isaiah, where in Isaiah 11, in one of the places, he expresses these things and says, well, that's just the dream of, you know, the dreams of an old white-haired man. Well, I'm an old white-haired man, and I dream too. But those things will be literal, just as literal as you can write them. And he goes on to say, and in that day, Whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. If you read Isaiah 65, verse 24, you'll find that Isaiah says that even before they ask, you just start thinking about it. And the, the purity of heart of people and the revelatory union between man and God will be such that the Lord will gain an answer even before you ask it. Whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. And he says, and in that day Satan shall have no power to tempt any man, and the reason he can't have power is because you, you destroy the basis of operation. Satan operates within the flesh and the corruption within the flesh. Read, for example, Second Nephi chapter uh, 2, where Lehi is talking about the great alternatives of righteousness that confront us. And he says, Choose eternal life, I'm reading verse 29, according to the will of the Holy Spirit, and not choose then eternal death, according to the spirit and power of the devil, brings you down to captivity. He says, for example, the spirit, <clears throat> and he says, I've spoken to them, well, let me get the passage that I want. <clears throat> I was going to a few, well, let's go back to verse 29. I have not, not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh. I knew that was that verse. And the evil which is therein. Now, where is there evil in the human organism? Not just in the spirit, but primarily in the flesh, right? Now, choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein. Now, when the earth is renewed, then there will be a cleansing, a sanctifying of the righteous. And the base of operation of old scratch will be destroyed. And he won't have power by reason of the renewal of the earth. And it says that day Satan shall have no power to tempt any man, and there should be no sorrow because there is no death. Now, not in the sense that you don't make the transition from mortality and so forth, 
but no death in the sense that the corruption that brings the process of deterioration into operation will be checked by reason of the renewal of all life. You'll have uh, 90-year-old football players with huge muscles and power and great powers and ability and skill. And you'll have 90-year-old beauty queens, curvaceous and lovely and beautiful. And let me suggest, brethren, that you get yourself worthy of them. And there will be a renewal of life, see. He said there should be no sorrow because there is no death. And in that day, he clarifies, an infant shall not die until he is old. And his life shall be as the age of a tree. And when he dies, he shall not sleep, that is to say, in the earth, but shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and shall be caught up, and his rest shall be glorious. And then the Lord goes on to say, Verily I say unto you, In that day the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things. And that will be a beautiful time. He says, Things which have passed, and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above, and things that are beneath, and things that are in the earth, and upon the earth, and in heaven, and all they who suffer persecution for my name, and endure in faith, though they are called to lay down their lives for my sake, yet shall they partake of all this glory. See? Now, that's a marvelous hope. See? Now, the earth will be renewed, brought back to its paradisiacal state. It will have two great poles of power, Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem, the order of Zion, the economic order of consecration. All things will be centered in Christ. The political kingdom will be extended, having been initiated by the Latter-day Saints in the Rocky Mountains in its incipient or beginning forms, and then extended to the New Jerusalem, and then, when the Jews are redeemed, extended over there, and then, uh, as the book of Daniel tells you, and I don't have time to get into it, then the heathen nations will give up their dominion. And uh, they will submit then to the kingdom of God politically. And God's kingdom will cover the earth before the church, and the gospel covers it spiritually. And then as that program is ushered in and established, then the gospel is taught in great power. And then you have the great conversion of the masses of humanity to the gospel. And those then who do not convert, as the Lord says through the Book of Mormon and also uh, Old Testament prophets, then they will be judged and destroyed. And you'll finally have the law laid. Now, that's the general picture. And, and while it may be interesting, my brothers and sisters, in a, oh, in a curiosity way and in an academic way, let me just bring it home to us again. This is the ball game we're playing. We haven't got to the ninth inning yet, but this is the ball game that we're playing. And we are at the batter's plate. The building of Zion depends upon you and depends upon me, it depends upon us listening to a living prophet and getting our houses in order and cleansing the inner vessel. It depends on getting the Book of Mormon and understanding what it is and make it a daily diet in our lives, see? And it depends upon getting in tune with the living prophet and our bishops and our state presidencies. It depends on these things. And the end result is putting away this crud and corruption that we see on undating America, on undating our children and our families, and finally putting a stop to that and cleansing things and getting Zion raises and in Zion and finally the cleansing of the earth and renewing the whole earth to a paradisical state of glory and righteousness and peace. Now is that worth working for? I want to bear you my testimony that these things are true. We are involved in this great work and that the Lord is directing it, and we've got a living prophet who's given us more than we believe and more than we practiced already. Now, the Lord bless us to further this work and to help it along. I pray humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> well, we've got two folks. Three. Three. When Christ comes and lives in the city of Zion, will, he re will we recognize him as Jesus Christ? Absolutely. You bet. He's not going to come to his own and not be recognized this time. Is it true that some saints may take part in the war at Armageddon? If so, why? I want to talk about this tomorrow night. I mean, I want to talk about the harvest season. 
and we'll get in, into the details on this. And I, I, I can't quite answer that now because we just don't have quite the background, but we'll get the general picture of it tonight. And then if you kind of resubmit the question in light of, of what we may not cover, I'd, I'd be happy to respond to it. How will earth reeling to and fro when Christ appears on the Mount of Olives affect America? You know, was it Wilford Woodruff? It was up in Logan. And uh, he kind of postulated the situation of the future of his day. And he talked about uh, New York sinking into the depths, he talked about Albany being destroyed and other eastern cities. Now, I don't know quite when that's going to take place, but it is a part of the prophetic literature of the Latter-day Saints. Now, when the seas heave beyond their bounds, you know, years ago they had an earthquake up here at uh, Hebgen Lake. And you ever heard of that one up uh, uh, this side of uh, West Yellowstone? It reached on down into the Rexburg area. Uh, we went on up to see what happened. There was a lake up there, and when that earthquake hit it, the waters of the lake just just like lifting up a bathtub, the one end of it, you know, about two feet, and then letting it drop. And the waters go vroom, vroom. Well, that's what's going to happen with the ocean. See, the Lord says, if I can just leave you with this comment in section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that when these things take place, then there's going to be a whole reorientation of the earth's surface. It says, for example, he shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries, and the island shall become one land. And the land of Zion and the land of Jerusalem shall be turned back into their own place, and the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided, back in the days of Peleg after the flood. And the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh. Now, these great cataclysmic upheavals in reshifting the earth's surface will take place. And that's what's going to cause the earth to reel to and fro, see? That in connection with a lot of other things. Now, let me turn to Third Nephi chapter 26 with you just a minute. Uh, we might have time just to get to a few of these things. Here's Jesus then. <coughs> Talking to the Nephites, began to unfold the prophetic picture, clear on down through to his second coming. I know what the record says, very brief but succinct. As it came to pass, when Jesus told these things, he expounded them to the multitude, and he'd expound all things, even to them both great and small. And he said, These scriptures which ye had not with you, the Father commanded that I should give unto you, for it is wisdom in in future generations. And he says, and he expound all things, even from the beginning until the time that he should come in his glory. Now, wouldn't that have been a marvelous thing to listen in on that one? He says, yea, even until things which should come, all things which should come uh, upon the face of the earth, even until the elements should melt with fervent heat, and that's when the veil is opened, and the earth shall be wrapped together as a scroll, and the heavens and the earth shall pass away. Now, that's the present heavens and the present atmospheric earth. Now, to wrap the earth together is a scroll. You've got a symbol of a scroll. I was in Samaria and saw the oldest Samaritan scroll in existence. And it had, uh, you know, the, the rod down here that you could wrap the scroll on over here. And you wrap that thing together. And as you wrap it together, then what happens? If you wrap the elements together, what happens to the water? It's driven back into the north countries. And then when you finally get the two ends of the scrolls right in together here, then you wrap one of them on through to where you get them all finally on one stake, see? Now, the Lord uses that as a symbol of what he's going to do with the earth. The earth is not only going to be renewed and brought back spiritually, it's going to be restored to the, to the geographical position that it was in and relationship it was in before the fall and before the flood, see? It's going to be brought back, and these great events will cause the sea not just to heave to and fro, but the, the great deep will be driven back into the north countries, and the whole earth and the mass of it will become one land. And it will be a rather interesting and a devastating kind of thing. 
and the earth will reel to and fro, and it will shake and tremble, and the cities of the nations will crumble into turmoil and chaos, and we hope that Brigham Young did a good job with the Salt Lake Temple because he said, I'm going to build it so that it will last through this stuff and on through into the millennium. And I believe maybe he's going to accomplish that job, see? But that's going to be the situation and how it will be. Well, thanks again for your attention, and again let me leave you my testimony that we're involved in the most important work that God has given to any people in any dispensation of time. And we're here in it, and we ought to be alive spiritually. Now the Lord bless us that we might do so, I humbly pray in Jesus' name, amen.